Welcome to the Not Sorry Art Podcast. I'm Sari Shrike, the artist and creator behind Not Sorry Art. I'm so excited to talk art and creativity with you. So grab a drink, grab a snack, and let's dive in. Hey y'all, welcome back to the Not Sorry Art Podcast. I'm Sari. Thanks for being here. One thing I like to do with my guest interviews is speak with a variety of voices in the art world, be it artists, gallerists, writers, financial experts, intellectual property law experts. And today I am so excited to add to this list by welcoming a curator to the show. My guest is Coco Trevino, the curator and director of programming at Big Medium, a nonprofit organization based in Austin, Texas that supports the community arts and artists here in Central Texas. COCA is a part of a team that organizes and curates some of the biggest annual art events in the state, including the Austin Studio Tour and the Texas Biennial. I wanted to ask COCA about what goes into her curating process, the challenges of building an art community and a nonprofit, and what goes into organizing a citywide art event such as the Austin Studio Tour. And y'all, if you've been here during that, it, it truly is the whole city kind of shuts down and does art for a couple weekends. So I hope you enjoyed the show and please visit the show notes to check out Coca's work with Big Medium and her other curatorial project, The Projecto. As always, happy creating. Thanks for being here and I hope you guys enjoy the episode. I also wanted to say that today's episode is sponsored by my book. I have a book coming out. I'm so proud of this, guys. Um, the links are already up. I'll have them in the show notes. But the book is called Modern Still Life, From Fruit Bowls to Disco Balls. It is my take on a step-by-step painting book. I am really excited about it. Not only does it have like motivational tips and tricks to keep you going in your practice, but it also has clear and beautiful and full color breakdowns of the step-by-step process in my paintings. So I could not be more excited about it. If you wanted to check it out, pre-order it, it would help me more than you even know. Hi, Coca Trevino. Thank you so much for being here. I am so giddy and so excited to talk with you. I feel like a lot of my audience probably resonates with really wanting to talk to a curator. (laughs) So much about being an artist is, you know, I don't know. It's just like, it's an important, I think, aspect to have writers and curators. And I consider a lot of what you do with big medium to be kind of a community builder, which is something in my podcast we've talked about a lot as far as like another creative outlet is community building. So on so many levels, I'm glad you're here. And I just wanted to extend a huge welcome to you. Thank you so much for thinking of me and for inviting me. It is it is a pleasure uh, spending time with artists. That's what I do and what that's what I dedicate my life to. So in any and all formats, it is a pleasure and I'm very grateful to, to be here with you. Yay, thank you. But I, I would be remiss if I didn't bring up, how are you doing? I know that we had scheduled our meeting before, but you had something absolutely tragic happen to Big Medium. I know y'all just moved into a new space and over, I think like a few weeks ago, there was a fire at Big Medium during our like ice snap um, or like our frozen, <laughs> um, we had some really cold, not Texas typical weather. Yes. How are you doing and how is the rebuilding process? Um, We're doing fine. I it's it's crazy because it is very um shocking and like low-key traumatic to be part of of that um we were extremely extremely lucky um that we it, we opened a new show with Tim Kerr and Robert Hodge a really gorgeous show um uh, that happened on a Friday uh on uh well Monday morning, it's when that freeze happened. And what it's believed is that someone unhoused was taking shelter in the back of our our gallery. And of course, like wanting to be, um, just bring some heat and warm, um, light up a fire and and that extended. Um, Luckily, we hear that there was no no lives lost. So that's the most important. And that's where we're lucky um, strike begin. Um, And and yeah, it, it is, it is shocking, but it could have been way worse. Um, we, um, yeah, and it's just, it, it's been a dealing with insurance that it's never fun. Mm-hmm. 
and and just trying to to do logistics to make sure that everyone's fine. We lost a piece of art, which, which was extremely sad, uh, and more so because um, we were with Tim Kerr, one of the artists there, when when we realized that happened. And I have I'm gonna be like 20 years uh, in my experience of professional like art stuff. Uh, and in those 20 years, I've never had something like this, which is just, it's awful just to, to know the artists and to see how much time and, and love they put into their work for it to just disappear. Um, that said, it was only the one piece out of 30 something. There are other pieces that were uh, lightly damaged, but or the firefighters did an amazing job. They were so careful with, with the works uh, and laid out everything. Like it was we were shocked on how beautifully uh, and how careful they were with the art. So yeah, we were very, very lucky. Um, we are rebuilding, we're dealing with the insurances and, and stuff like that. We did, a lot of artists reached out saying that they would offer works, which was really heartwarming. And we didn't, um, I mean, at the beginning, we were like, no, not at all. But then we were like, you know what, let's do that. But let's, we usually take a 25% per, commission because we're a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. uh, but for this one, we took a 50% commission so that we assure that the artists were receiving uh, money and we would do to, uh, to help with this campaign. And at the same time, we're going to donate a portion of that to uh, an organization that deals with uh, or, or supports on housing individuals so yeah. um just making trying to make the the most out of this um and spread the the love and the luck with with everyone around us yeah beautifully beautifully said and handled and yes to your point it is such a, a good thing that lives were not lost and yeah. a real testament to the fact that you know supporting unhoused people is like really supporting the entire community um, and I, I think it's so good that you're you know kind of full circle with this, you're giving back to something that's really, really needed in Austin. Austin has, you know, if I'm, if anyone's listening from not Austin, we have a really bad track record with um, not helping our, our unhoused community. So yeah, thank you for that update. And I really appreciate it. And I appreciate what you guys are doing. Oh my gosh. Thank you. No, we, we are, we're fully aware and, and we are fully aware that art, sometimes it's used for the wrong reasons and to whitewash and to artwash. And, okay. and we are occupying space that do, did not belong to us. So we we are aware and we are trying our best to be very mindful and, and offer as much support as we can. Being uh, also aware that we are not, this is not our specialty. We are not educated, well educated in, in this matters and, and there, it would be very irresponsible for us to to act as if we did. So through art, that it's what we know what to do. We're trying to do our, our best to to extend a hand and to place some support because it, it is super unfair and, and we do not approve of what the changes have been done, like and, and how um, all the their laws and the the changes in Austin have been beneficial mostly for for people that are already wealthy so uh yeah just one one of the things is that that we've been thinking a lot about is like how to get uh more noisy and more um just stronger in or in how we express ourselves with uh the community but uh mainly in in um or with our officials because they have like some power i mean everything is like Right. It's like the whole world is going through a bunch of stuff for so we we know it's a little bit of step but but Austin should be better and and we are trying to take part of that yeah yeah well and I mean I think you guys do a great job and one thing about big medium is that I've really seen a lot of strides for like inclusivity but I guess I wanted to start out if we can jump into it yeah. um asking a little bit more about you and like more specifically like how did you get involved in community building and uh curation in the art world um would you mind sharing a little bit about that of course um I was born and raised in Monterrey Mexico um I I went to art school over there and it was fun and, and I really liked it. But very, very soon on, I, I realized that I was not as good as other people um, in, in the art making, but I was really good. I mean, 
I was uh, very excited about what other people were doing and I was really good at talking about it. And I was very excited about different projects that friends were making and through my excitement and through my love for them, uh, sometimes I would get them to, uh, I mean, purchases or connections or stuff. So it, it started super naturally. And luckily I identified right away, like this is something I good at, I'm good at. This is something that I love doing. Like I, I love being, um, I, I don't make the art, but I am a, a part of the, of the art success and, and the sharing of good people. So um, that's how I started back in college. Uh, then my ex-partner, he's a musician and in he we I was applying the same thing. So back in Monterrey, we started um, an organization that was about uh, committing fully to artists in any any realm and supporting them and connecting them to to people that would employ them or that would use um, their their talents in a in a mindful way. Um, after like some stuff happened in, in Mexico, like some some hard stuff, and um, we lost or or work. We were just working out of um, just the arts and music. So and we were doing great and we were really happy. But then like violence started happening back there, and that's the first thing that shut down. Like all events, all uh, art and and stuff, and understand understandably so. Um, uh, luckily, I'm I'm both citizens of the U.S. and Mexico. So when that happened, I I figured like this is a good moment um, to just move and and start this from scratch. Um, and we moved here thinking that Austin, it was like a very welcoming place, uh, very uh, open in arts and, and music. And, uh, and it, it seemed like the ideal place to move. And we did that. It, it took it, it was way harder than what we anticipated. Um, I did have like a full resume with um, art galleries and museums and all the things and that didn't really clicked for the longest time uh, okay. but eventually I was hired at a big medium that happened in 2018. Um, Congratulations. Thank you <laughs> yeah I started as a program coordinator and then I, I started growing uh, until my position right now as a curator and director of programming um, and it's just loving I mean it, it is a an a uh, profession of love and passion and um it was also very visible to me how like it growing in Mexico the the racial uh items are very very different we like the whole world has racism for sure and classicism and and all of that so we all experience it in different ways mm -hmm. um I learned a lot moving here I, I've been very very lucky I've only had a few incidents that are not awful but it I'm was so sorry yeah. no it yeah. happened yeah thank yeah. you yeah. uh but it it just it is a new reality and I am the foreigner and I am the like all this others mm -hmm. um so it, it was a, a process of learning a lot and and to because I'm always trying to see beauty and like, that's what I do for a living. It was a, a moment where I had to sit and, and just think about and, and seeing what I was seeing and who was being more visible than others. Um, and it just happened very naturally that I was like, wait, I'm seeing so much talent here. Why are these people not being highlighted? Yeah. Uh, or even when the, the first show that I curated a big medium was one, um, but I wasn't the curator yet, but I proposed, I, I pitched that to, to Shay Little, our executive director, and, and he let it be. And it was uh, two artists from Mexico uh, that one of them, it's like really into technology and really like creates the most beautiful machines. And it was very important for me to show a different Mexican art or Latino art. It, and so it was, I was leading the charge with that in mind to fight stereotypes, to, to just let the people shine. Right. Um, and, and with that and, and having a, a bunch of wonderful friends and people that uh, maybe didn't know it, but they were educating me and, and all the, the life and the living in the States, uh, I just started to be really, really passionate about it. And, 
and really being like I feel like it it until that point it was very like natural mm -hmm. and like almost accidental and and it just took reflection and love of what I was doing but once I I had a, a little bit of I, I had the position and, and I realized like I had to be way more intentional uh so that's how I just sat and and thought and and use this as a big opportunity for for just yelling and and being as loud as I could and how how important and how good it is to to focus on these things because it is good for absolutely everyone when we put up front the diversity inclusivity and equity yeah beautiful and it sounds like such an artist's journey you know I'm sure I don't have to convince you but if anyone's listening, like I'm really passionate that, you know, art doesn't have to look like a painting or a song that like, you know, community building and all kinds of, you can get as creative with, you know, what you consider to be a creative practice as you are yeah. with art itself. And, you know, the way you describe that, you know, your lived experience, you know, the, I always think like, if you boil down what an artist is, you're a problem solver. And so much of your journey felt like you're problem solving beautifully and coming up with creative solutions and tapping into your community and network and giving back. Um, it really is. It was beautiful to listen to. Um, you know, I'm curious, like what your thoughts are on, like, how do you identify what you do as like creative process? And do you like, how do you approach, you know, whenever you're, you, you said when you were selecting artists, like initially it was, it was just organic because it's who, you know, but now you approach it with a lot more like intentionality. Could you walk us through kind of what that process looks like? Of course, um, I do look at art as much as I can. And, and it is a very selfish uh, thing in a way because I just love it. And once, like, I don't even remember how how it happened, but very early on in my life, I kind of decided I want to be surrounded by beauty. And like, that was my whole goal. And like, I didn't think about that for many, many years. And then I was like, oh my God, like I was, thinking about being a curator like I, I didn't know it then but that's I'm doing it I'm being surrounded by that and and I'm and yeah that I do it on purpose so um I I do go I try to go as many fairs and as many things as I can I also consume a lot of um, insta like and following people and, and places and stuff so I I do like research quote unquote a Definitely lot. research yeah yeah it, it is it takes different shapes but yeah I, I try to be uh very um focused on, on that and and looking for the art everywhere yeah. um because I love design and I love craft and I love uh like all kinds like gar like gardens are one of the yeah. things that make me the happiest person ever uh, so yeah I try to to look for all those things and then once I'm um there's people that flat out like excite me and I'm like mm -hmm. oh my god I want to work with you and um and usually that comes and that's part of the amazing uh, thing of doing like emergent art mm -hmm. um because some people are are so close to making it they just need a last push or they just need someone to trust them and give them some money uh and space and, and that's one of the happiest things that I get to do like yeah. when when I identify that and sometimes it is about and that happens with the Tito's Price and and other uh, or the blind residency as well like sometimes you think like think of two artists mm -hmm. and uh one of them it's so close and they, but they have like some um connections and stuff and like we we pay at, right now we pay three thousand dollars um up to the artist to to be able to to exhibit um so that that money that it's not a lot it's a very modest thing we are aware but that's what we can do for now yeah, um still tremendously that, helpful it makes a huge yeah difference. we hope yeah. um that will impact an artist differently that someone that does not have that or that hasn't been able gotten a chance to explore or stuff so um that even though they could be at the same level, the impact will be different. Uh, and we try to be very mindful of that. Um, and also we um, we really emphasize that the space, the gallery in particular is uh, experimental. Mm -hmm. So we are not, we love sales, mm -hmm. sales benefit everyone. And we want Austin to be better about collectorship, but 
our space is it's welcome to just experiment and if you want to you always had this crazy idea and and you didn't have a space to do it like we want you to come and do it here because because we yeah it's needs that our artists have and and sometimes you need to break the thing to realize like this was not the way or this is the way um so so that's how we started just thinking about this things like taking a lot of references but but just figure trying to figure out and of course we don't we're not geniuses or clairvoyants or anything so we we don't know but we put all of our uh, hopes on on being able to to decipher that and at the same time um trying to figure out like what is austin doing right. and austin has some some stuff that it's uh sometimes about waves of different things and influences like just like any city so if we see a void of a, a unique type of art uh, we want to bring it to because we are serving artists and also community um so we both would try to to do it um i have to say like it is um yeah, like we we serve everyone. We try to serve everyone, but we we also are very very intentional about our audience and our artists, like especially the BIPOC, because mm-hmm. um, because that's uh, here in Austin. It's a it's a huge mm-hmm. gap uh, in artists and in um, communities served. Um, and and if you go to contemporary art, like yeah, like BIPOC communities, sometimes they have this amazing cultural centers or different spaces that won't probably won't risk as much. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we we wanna okay. go there and yeah. and let this um, artist experiment and be their own. Um, but yeah, like and I love community centers like we have partnered with them a lot like sometimes they have some pool that we wouldn't mm-hmm. um so I, I do think like it's a collaboration thing where uh their audiences and our art or vice versa all like really uh benefit from each other yeah yeah that's beautiful I love how you you said that and how you integrate with other communities but you're really carving out a specific niche for like emerging artists and experimental artists. And I think it's important to highlight that, yeah, that is kind of a risky gap in the market for a lot of people. Um, you know, I, I have a question for you about, you know, someone's listening to this and maybe they don't consider themselves like they didn't go to art school or, you know, I, I even remember with me, like I was able to get a bachelor's. I had a running scholarship, so I was able to go to college. Awesome. And I remember being even in my painting classes with my like professor and still being like, oh, well, I'm painting, but I'm not part of the fine art world. Like yeah. I just grew up so alienated from it. Fine art felt so like out of reach and not for me. And I never got it. And I just was like, okay, well, it's not, I like to, I like to paint, but it's not for me. Um, And I I can imagine if I felt that way within a school setting, a lot of people who maybe haven't had access to formal education, or even kind of like you were saying with your story, how like you had a little bit of a challenge with your credentials transferring into the States, even though you had all this great experience, you know, it's, it's not always as cut and dry is like, I'm good at art. I have the experience. How does this transfer? A lot of times you have to advocate for yourself and find organizations like Big Medium to help you advocate. My question is, if somebody feels like they're listening to this and they're kind of in that gap where they're like, maybe I didn't consider myself an artist, but I'm making good stuff. I'm passionate about it. Like, how do you, like, what would you suggest them to do, you know, whether they live in Austin and Big Medium is part of their community or they live elsewhere? Like, what encouragement would you have for that person to pursue it, to like do the work, to write an artist statement? What what encouragement would you give that person? Of course, um, this is something that I get asked often. And to me, there's nothing you can do better than being yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would go like, I don't know, social media or research, like what is an institution or an artist that you love and that, or that you identify with, let's say like you're checking, like even if you're outside of Texas, like mm-hmm. there's some content from this gallery or this nonprofit or this artist that you follow and you really um, feel identified with. I think like just explore that more. Like if it's an artist, like where do they exhibit? What are they consuming and stuff? And it's not about copying, it's about like, surrounding yourself by these elements that excite you because if they excite you you'll be better mm-hmm. at talking about your work and you'll be better at, at just connecting the dots and I feel like 
people can definitely uh, feel that. Um, if you're just sending an email for everyone, which I've done, like yeah, we all have, yeah, yes. <laughs> like you're just trying to get it done. I, totally. I get it, but it won't translate the same as if you're informed, as if you know, like, I don't know, and um, like, oh, this artist exhibited in this places, like, oh, I love it. Maybe I'm not at the level of that artist, but I should go and see their programming, or I should go and volunteer on those places because you're I'm a very practical place in person so yeah. uh, you would be closer to what you want mm -hmm. and you'll be consuming like even just by being at their events you'll you'll be like yeah just showered with with the elements that it hopefully one day will push you to to be there and be ready uh and it's just work work a lot take time mm -hmm. I there is something that it's really heartbreaking sometimes like people that are really really good but they just rush and don't yeah. finish the thing like there is so many artists that are doing really good work and just don't finish pieces or yeah. just they're rushed to go to the next one I say take your time and also it's I mean it's a thing like knowing how to edit yourself it's it's really really hard yeah. but I think like you can get to that point by practicing and sitting with your pieces and comparing and it's not what sells and it's not what your mom likes it's like what feels right to you so just being yourself and really having that connection to you and what you're up for uh, and what what you like and what excites you to me like that's everything at, at least that's how I've done things and uh, I've been it's very slow but very lucky mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's great advice. And I, I think it's always worth hearing, like, be honest, be authentic with yourself. Like you can, you know, the special thing about you is that you can only make the art that you can make. I know that's a bit of a cliche at this point, but it's so true. I have like this thought, I'm curious. Um, I love to throw this past a curator and let me know what you think. I have students who will ask me kind of the same thing. I'm like, how do I break in? I don't have, you know, art experience, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I think it's tough because there's a fine line where you do want them to like look at their own artwork and be authentic to themselves and not feel like they're having, oh, that's successful. I'm going to chase that or I'm going to do. So it's like, it's having that as your foundation. But I also think that there's like what you said, I think, which is staying plugged into the community and, and into the art world, because there's this idea that art is like, you're just responding to culture. And I think that's true. But one thing I found with years and maturity is that you're also kind of responding to the conversations in the art world. And I think that's largely what distinguishes someone be from being on the quote outside as an artist versus yeah. inside is it's not being art educated in a formal way per se. It's just, are you aware of what's happening and what's on ex exhibition and what's happening in the art world? And I think it, the tough thing is like, stay true to what you're doing, but also be aware, not you don't have to be so influenced by it, but just be aware of the art conversations and the art lingo and like being like just familiarized with that part of the art world, almost like it's part of your job, like read, you know, read the newspapers or check out the art you know, on, on Saturday morning, what was showed last night, even if you can't make it out because you've got multiple jobs, just staying really, really plugged into the art world. Yeah, and, and I sometimes I, I'm overwhelmed by being out and sometimes I avoid openings like a plague, but it's just like I just take a moment and go when it's like uh, in the middle of the week or make an appointment or just sit and see the work and, and like I see the work on Insta and then I go to their websites and like check more and maybe videos and stuff like that. It, it is important, but at the same time, like if it's not interesting to you, just don't like go go to the things that vibrate with you because it it can be and I'm I'm always it's a, it might sound weird but I'm always trying to check myself because yeah. we get to be complacent and and if we love what we do and we have a following or you have someone that buys your art like you're like yeah I did it but just you have to keep challenging yourself again, with things that you like, or maybe things that make you uncomfortable, but you're intrigued by like, whatever makes you feel, I think that 
uh, you just surround yourself by that. And But yeah, you have to know which are the organizations that are doing things. Um, you have to know like what kind of art has been made. Again, like love it or hate it, it's, it really doesn't matter. It's just that you're aware and, and you wanna make sure that you're not make, making copies of things or like if everyone's painting blue, like maybe you paint a different color. Like yeah. it, it is because there are tendencies like that and not, mm -hmm. not even on purpose, but the whole world, like yeah, we're social creatures. This. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> totally. So I'd say that one thing that maybe people will check out right after this, but as a curator, I'm going to tell you um, mm -hmm. oh, one, first of all, like if you make money by painting, like, com like common things or, or I don't know, like the flowers or the pets or whatever, more power to you. Like yeah. I would say, just separate those practices. If you have uh, the intention of have like a, a fine arts thing, yeah. if painting or making sculptures or if, if your creative endeavors give you money, just hold to them and, yeah. and yes, um, do that. Like eventually, hopefully y'all be able to, to live on the things that are the most passionate to you. That is such good advice. I, I love, I love that you said that because I feel like there's this trope around being like a struggling artist. And that's something early in my career I struggled with is yeah. I, you know, I didn't have a trust fund. I had to be yeah. my own, I had to be my own financier and that started out with humble pet portraits. So I just wanted to yeah. highlight and say, thank you so much for saying that. Of course. No, my, me too. Like when I first moved here, I couldn't get a job and I would just call my artist friends from Monterrey and I was like, you stay here. And, and I like, like my sister was dating this guy that was a manager of bars in rainy street now they're married luckily oh. uh, but i would ask him like hey can i do an event and he was like okay monday mondays are slow so i started doing happenings wow. and because it was just one day i was like okay let me create as many as much buzz as i can and my friends are visiting or this artist like that i just met is really cool so i was trying to make things happen for, for me uh but just like yeah we we have to figure it out one day like it's awesome to have money I assume but in the meantime if you're doing art like or if you're being creative like heck yeah like yeah. do it just make sure that you have a different account or something so that you can be more intentional about what you put out on, on the other practice and that people don't get like cycled on on the she's a pet uh artists yeah. or whatever which happens all the time and it's gross mm -hmm. but let's that it's also good to have the the mm -hmm. mentality separated totally. so i'd say like yeah. just do it uh, i would just say for the fine arts i doubt there is anyone that we need their take on mona lisa or frida yeah. or any of those things like mm -hmm. i i doubt we need another one i think like the world has enough if it's for you, I mean, do whatever it makes you happy. Yeah. But for a fine arts mm -hmm. thing, I don't know that there's any more need of of those uh, people. So I, I'd say like, try and do your friends. And again, someone that you're attached with, someone that you're passionate about, you'll get the best. Um, and, and these figures, as much as they can sell, mm -hmm. um, to me, it's just like, when I'm seeing this in, in um when I'm reviewing art and stuff, it's like, what are you trying to say that hasn't been said? And to me, it puts you, or, or it puts artists in like, okay, they're trying to please someone. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a turn off for me personally. Like I, I'm yeah. sure there will be other people that think differently. And, and if you love painting your Frida's, I'm glad. But I, I'd say be be more cautious on what you present to to galleries or curators or stuff because we want to see you and your life and what is your opinion or your view in the world not on pop culture necessarily yeah yeah I think that's that's great advice uh, you know to bandwagon onto what you said I think one thing that's been really helpful is I've had a lot of writers in my life and I know art and writing don't all you know always go together hand in hand like not yeah. if you're an artist you're not always a good writer but I will say like having the practice from college where I'm writing an artist statement having to think well why am I making this and mm -hmm. you know not to say that I've ever had good artist statements but having a writer nearby who can say well why do you think that or can you explain yeah um, if you have an artist or like a writer friend in your life, like do a swap with them, have them look over your stuff. Um, that for me has been, it's such an easy 
like way to like not overthink it. Just have a writer yeah. look at whatever you're doing. And that's been really helpful for me. A hundred percent. And don't feel like you need to use big words or complex because 80% time of a hundred, uh, they're just fillers and they mean nothing. So be very comfortable with the language that you use. I rather read someone like saying like, I love art. And this is like, I, when I was uh, like teenager, like art, blah, 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 like something real that just buzzwords that are there to confuse. <laughs> like, don't. Yeah. You don't have to slip in juxtapose every plain speak. Totally. I think, um, yeah, that's such a bad misconception that we see all the time where it has to be, your writing has to be so frilly and big words. And I understand where people come from when they do that. I think there's a little bit of an insecurity. Again, if you don't feel like you got the best education, you know, what am I missing? Is there a secret handshake? Is that why everyone's using all these big words? And um, you definitely don't have to, you have, you know, mm -hmm. from my experience, I, I condensed my language and made it a little more straightforward. And that has been very helpful. And I'm, I'm glad to hear you echo yeah. that sentiment. ChatGPT is also a tool for us. I would say dump your brain, like your thoughts in there if you don't have it clear and you will have to put human <laughs> arrangements but chat gpt can give you the first draft of of whatever you want to see uh want to say excuse me yeah absolutely especially if you have like dyslexia or a language barrier like use yeah. those tools to your advantage if that has been something that felt you felt like it was keeping you out of the art world like the art world, the more, the thing I've noticed is like, the more you feel like you're left out of the art world, the more the art world probably needs your point of view. I say yes. that a lot. And it's like, I it just don't feel like you have to change. If you don't see yourself in the art world, use that as your invitation into the art world. Talk mm -hmm. about it. Talk about how you feel outside of it. And honestly, that perspective to me, I, at least as like an art lover myself is always the most interesting. Totally. Yeah. And I wanted to talk a little bit more about big medium and more specifically, mm -hmm. like the challenges of being like a community point. Like I know your job is amazing. Curator sounds like such a dream job. It's truly amazing. I hope I'm inspiring other people with this. I know we're inspiring people with this interview, but um, I wanted to ask about like the thankless part of being uh, maybe a part of something like this and how it can be challenging a little bit because I guess what I'm trying to do is shine a light on like what you're a curator and that's your your job title, but like what Big Medium does and like other art organizations in different city does for the community because my biggest familiarity with y'all is that you put on um, studio tours. So we have mm -hmm. in Austin, East and West, you know, the city's kind of divided in half that way. And you, you show art, you team up with businesses. If you are lucky enough to live inside the city, you can show your studio space. Um, and it's a really fun, really beautifully planned out event that I'm tremendously grateful for. Um, but I also know that it's like, it can feel like a bit of a thankless job where, you know, the arts are already so undervalued in a lot of ways. And I feel like when you're a support system within the art world, it's just like, sometimes that can be magnified in certain ways. Yeah. I'm curious, like, what is something if you could tell like anyone listening, you know, like what are some of the challenging points and like, you know, how, how do you deal with those and what keeps you going? Um, I, there's, I don't know how much I should say, but yes, it is a, a the studio tour in particular, it is a very challenging um, project. Uh, it's a project that we love and it's a project that we are aware um, has a lot of impact in our community not only for big medium, for artists, for people that live in Austin, for businesses, like it, it creates a whole um, environment and, and kind of niche that it's kind of huge. Uh, yeah. So it, it is, I think it is a really important program. Um, sadly, we don't have the support that we would uh, hope financially. Mm -hmm. um, so it is, um, since since the pandemic, since 2020, uh, we haven't had much support from the city, which mm -hmm. is, I mean, we we 100% back the giving a uh, priority to to diverse in um, organizations. I don't know if you know, but uh, apparently Austin is the the city with more nonprofits in the U.S. Oh, so, I didn't know that. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I, that, that's what I've heard multiple times. Wow. So it is kind of wild and it's understandable. And we, I, I mean, personally, and I know um, Shay, our executive director, was very loud about being um, prioritizing uh, BIPOC organizations. So that for sure um, 
but it a lot of other things happen a lot of um yeah it's there is not a lot of money and the money that there is it's been spread around as much as the stuff uh at city is is um able to do but yeah so we we have we have been at uh, seeing a decline on, on the funding that we get from the mm -hmm. city and it is or like we fight a lot to keep costs low for artists which it's pretty much impossible because of how the world has changed and how yeah. Austin in particular has gotten more and more expensive yeah. um so yeah just financially it is more and more complicated um it, but also like the last year we were three people on staff wow it's, yes uh and we do absolutely yes. everything in yeah. there uh at the end we had more support like for for the events and stuff like that like but but I think empathy mm. having empathy would be ideal yeah. from artists specifically because we know we're serving y'all and we know um we are uh taking some of your money uh but you yeah it's just rem remembering that this is a collaborative thing like we are not we don't have the capacity to do all the things that we would want. So being empathetic with, with our team would go so far yeah. in, in the ways that we show up for you. Cause if someone screams at us like yeah. at one moment and then like the next people won't get the best from us. Um, so it's just that. And also businesses and people that have, or people that do the, the, um, unofficial and stuff mm -hmm. like we get it but that said you can be official and ask for a fellowship we have we give fellowships to pretty much everyone that asks for them wow. uh but we want to represent like it's good for our numbers and it's good to um to for our grants to to show that p people are wanting to participate and and we understand like that the yeah like back to money like it, yeah. it is really hard but we can actually help with that and we try to fundraise specifically for for applications to be free uh for for as many people that we can so if if you can engage that is way better for us um and businesses the same like if you're getting um some money in because of the tour and but you don't have maybe the fee um to to put it up front like maybe make a donation and that way it ensures that we can keep doing it um the book is extremely expensive and we do it as well Shay Little has been doing it for the last few years and the map and stuff and it is crazy yeah. hard and it's uh, a beautiful so book too I you know I have one from all the years I so I've got this little stack of my bookshelf of them and, oh, and they're awesome. wonderful to look back at and they're really kind of pieces of art in and of themselves and I love what you said about compassion because I think that's the thing you know I get I always feel sympathetic because like I get why artists are frustrated it's like you know you are we are often undervalued culturally you know in a world that prioritizes you know, tech and sales and the economy. And, you know, it, we're a world that it runs off of those systems that, you know, to get people to value, like why invest in the arts, why invest in art writers and curators is already a hard job. But I think what you said is great. Like we're basically on the same team mm -hmm. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, it's okay to be frustrated with the state of the world, but like not, you know, the team, usually the people with you in the trenches aren't the one, <laughs> you know, yeah, we, we're trying. And if, if imagine like, if if there is any delays or something, if it's an inconvenience for you, imagine the inconvenience that is for the for the group that it's putting it up. So just little reminders here and there of like we're all on the same team and just yeah. try and be patient. If you cannot make it, just send an email. Like you'll get answers from odds are from me. <laughs> uh, so yeah, just just be a little bit patient. And also honestly filling out uh, the the applications and stuff, the earlier that you do it, you have more time to fix it and to go back and forth. Like, I'm not advising you do that. Please don't do that. <laughs> but like, if you're going to. If you're going yeah, yeah. to, it's it's way easier for me to make a correction like with a month out than the, the week of that everyone else is doing it too. So yeah. it, yeah. yeah it's, that's, well, I'm... I'm 
I have a book right now and even like a for-profit book with like all of the like, you know, built-in security of like being a big business and all that. Like even then, like getting late edits is crazy. So, I mean, I, I can imagine on a, a project that's as fun, is as funded by passion as it is by finances, yeah. that could be incredibly challenging. Um, I wanted to just say again, thank you for being here. Are there any like final thoughts you have you'd like to share with like a group of artists, like any, you know, encouragement or anything to know about your job that you want to leave us with today? Yes, um, I'm just to say it, it is a privilege to to serve. And uh, yeah, I, I, I love my job and it comes at a lot of cost, like personally and time wise and mental health wise, but I do what I love and it's serving you guys and, and serving like the world through beauty in, in whatever way it shows. Uh, so I, I'm just wanted to say like, it, it is amazing. And honestly, like if you see open calls, go for it. Odds are like, if you are, if you're working through like something that you don't like, maybe stop. Yeah. But if you have a few pieces that you love or that you feel like fit in, just do it because people will see your work and maybe you, you won't get the thing this time, but probably like if you keep working at it and if you resonate with a curator or the organization, you'll probably get in there. So try, try a lot. Uh, we just launched the Texas Biennial Open Yay. Call. So that, that will be a, an opportunity and it's three women of color that will be uh, curating. So we're, we're really happy about that. And I'm included in there. Uh, so I'm, I'm very, very excited. And this one has a fee, um, but that's an, another um, reminder, like whenever, don't let money be the the thing that doesn't let you go like just ask um we yeah. put it in the guidelines like if if that is prohibitive like just let us know like we'll figure it out yeah. uh, and i feel like most organizations would do the same like just just tell us um we have to uh figure out our own finances so it is yeah. sadly it's not something that we can put um just for free but and also like know that and oftentimes fees are there um, to kind of separate people that are just like, yeah, just put in whatever. Like yes, it, it is, yes. it takes a little bit of more seriousness to invest, invest in the work. Uh, but if, but don't let that discourage you because odds are like, we're going to be there for you and we'll, we'll figure it out. We, we want to see your work and we want to see your growth. And there's not like a larger, uh, happiness that seeing like artists grow year by year it is honestly what keeps us alive and kicking because we want to we want to grow with you yeah beautiful I love that thank you so much for sharing and all of your advice and insights I know it's going to be so helpful and thank you for everything you do a big medium I'm really excited for the biennial and um yeah thank you for your time um where can people find you if they want to keep up with you if they want to follow big medium uh how can we stay connected to you of course uh, we do the instagram big medium austin um, then we have our website, uh, bigmedium.org, and that you can subscribe to the newsletter and get all the things. Uh, personally, I also have my curatorial career and an organization that I just uh, I just opened a gallery right in the Big Medium Complex. Congratulations. It's, thank you. <laughs> the project, the Projecto ATX. Mm -hmm. It's like the project and then O, mm -hmm. ATX. Uh, and, and you can follow me there and also, uh, yeah, DM or whatever. I, of course, I'm really booked uh, right now, but I do my best to, to answer to emails or requests. Um, but yeah, like lately I'm curating for, for this too, but also I'm, I'm very lucky that um, I got I get some gigs to to travel and to do outreach. So uh, people are actually interested in, in BIPOC artists and or LGBTQ plus artists. And, and so uh, I'm, I'm very lucky that people hire me sometimes to to find these voices. So know that I'm looking out for you and I'm, I'm doing my best to to put you uh, in the best spot for you. Oh, beautiful. Thank you. And I will link all of that below so people can go take a look and see what you're up to and what you're doing. And it sounds like it's a lot. Uh, <laughs> so I'll let you go and respect your time. But thank you again so much for being here. Thank you so much for the invitation and the lovely conversation. It's weird to talk that much about myself. <laughs> oh, you're great. You're great. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
I also wanted to take a moment to thank everyone who has taken the time to leave a review. It is incredibly helpful for podcasts to be able to see how we're impacting y'all. As always, I appreciate it so much. I wanted to say a special thank to this week's review. Someone by the name of Rebuary, thank you so much for leaving your kind words. As always, it's such a delight to read how this podcast is impacting y'all. If you would like to have your name or handle read off on next week's episode, make sure to leave a review. Let me know how I'm doing and I'll talk to you guys next week.